In the previous part, we learned what vector operations can do and how to use them in C++. But it may seem that these are rather strange operations. We could do, for instance, vector additions fast, but how often do you have code in which you would need to do that? Let me tell a silly story that may help you to get the right mindset. You have a construction project in which you need to fasten some pieces of wood with nails. You got a normal scalar hammer, something all of us have seen, with which you can drive nails into wood. No matter where your individual nails are, you can easily hit them one by one. Bang, 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 bang. But this is sequential work. Can we do it faster with some parallelism? You go to the PPC hardware store and find a brand new vector hammer. The salesperson promised you could drive four nails with one swing, four times more throughput. But then you get back home, look at your project, look at the vector hammer, you don't see any place in which you would have four nails in a row conveniently placed so that you could make efficient use of the vector hammer. So was the salesperson cheating you? Actually, the tool is just fine. Your project is wrong. You have to get back to the drawing board. You need to redesign your whole project, keeping in mind that you will eventually be driving the nails with your vector hammer. Always four nails in a row, conveniently spaced. This is exactly what happens when you try to use vector operations in your own program. You start with an existing program and maybe there isn't a single place in the code in which you could make good use of vector operations. You need to design your program logic and data structures so that you all the time keep in mind that eventually, in the innermost loops, you will want to benefit from vector operations. It may feel totally wrong to design programs so that you start with the tool that you want to use. But often this is the only way to benefit from the massive amount of parallel processing power that we have in our CPUs. And this can be also rewarding. There is plenty of room for creativity when you try to use vector operations also in applications in which you don't see at first any room for their use. Often you will need to do something like this. First, you will need to pre-process your input data and somehow pack individual data elements into vectors. The number of input elements is typically not a nice multiple of 4 or 8, so some amount of padding is often needed, or otherwise you need to process some small number of elements separately. Then only after all of this work you can do vector operations. And then you have got a result in a vector form, and you need to somehow unpack it and extract what you really want. And please be careful here. Before you even start to go through all this trouble, do some ballpark estimates to make sure the time you spend doing pre-processing and post-processing won't dominate the running time. There are many different ways in which you can turn your input data into vectors. Maybe it makes sense to split each row into vectors of size 8. Or maybe it is better to split each column into vectors of size 8. Sometimes your input data might naturally suggest some way to organize data in vectors. For example, in image processing, it might make sense to pack an RGB triple into one vector of size 4. And there's also a lot of room for creativity here. And while 
many approaches are possible. Often, some of them lead to a much more efficient code than others. Remember, you want to do similar operations for each vector, and you usually would like to do element-wise operations, something like element-wise addition or multiplication. So try to choose a data layout in which such operations are common. Here is an example. Again, recall our sample application. In the innermost loop, we do plain old scalar operations. Read a float, read another, addition minimum. We do this n times in the innermost loop. Could we somehow benefit from vector operations here? Let's first arrange some room for parallelism. Assume n is a multiple of 2. Here we have a version in which we accumulate two minimums, v0 and v1, and only combine the result in the very end. This should ring some bells. This is similar to what we did to get some instruction level parallelism. But the key thing is that we have now arranged code so that they are always pairs of similar independent operations. And if n happens to be a multiple of 8, we can easily go much further. Here we have got groups of 8 similar independent operations. This should give nice instruction level parallelism. But that's not what we are interested in here. The key point is that we have now written our code so that there are places in which we could replace eight scalar operations with one vector operation. Now we are finally ready to use our vector hammer. And the code looks like this. Wherever we had, for instance, eight individual variables x0 to x7, we have now got just one vector variable, dx. And wherever we had, for instance, eight scalar additions, we have got one vector addition. We need to take care of packing our data in vectors in pre-processing so that we can read our input with one vector read instead of eight scalar reads. But once this is done, our code is pretty straightforward. By the way, please note that we lost something. There's no instruction level parallelism here anymore. All vector minimums depend on previous vector minimums. So if you want to have instruction level parallelism, you need to again accumulate multiple vector minimums. But even if you don't bother to do that, the code already performs pretty well. Overall, by using vector operations and OpenMP, we have already improved the running time from our original 99 seconds to only 4 seconds. Now we would expect that we could just take all three forms of parallelism, use all of them simultaneously, and the end result would be something that uses all possible resources of the CPU. Unfortunately, in many applications, it isn't that easy. Usually, when you do calculations, you want to get some input data from the main memory. And the CPU can do arithmetic operations much faster than what it can read data from the main memory. There is a factor 50 difference. So for maximum performance, you can only afford to get 2% of your input data from the main memory. Whatever data you read from memory needs to be heavily reused, or you won't have much hope of a good performance. We will talk about this in a lot more detail next week.